content warning. The following episode includes discussion of sexual themes and deadly violence. Listener discretion is advised. A pretty big godsend, for lack of a better word, when it comes to navigating my exit from evangelical Christianity has been the online communities that comprise the exvangelical movement. And it includes sharing our stories. Some include manipulation, abuse, discrimination, and other severe harm perpetrated by evangelical leaders and peers. Other stories include finding that evangelical doctrine or theology can be contradictory and leaves people wanting. Lots of cognitive dissonance. And still other stories touch on cult-like beliefs within evangelicalism, such as purity culture, quiverful, and Christian dominionism. Or a mix of all those and more. But what seems to come up a fair amount is that as far as the setting goes for these evangelical experiences that lead people to leave the tradition, and in some cases Christianity as a whole, especially in the United States, is that these evangelical spaces tend to be overwhelmingly white. And that shouldn't be particularly surprising. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, quote, It is appalling that the most segregated hour of Christian America is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. End quote. And he wasn't wrong. And if he were alive today and made this observation, he wouldn't be wrong now either. The vast majority of churches are overwhelmingly of one race. Also, the leadership of most evangelical churches specifically tends to be overwhelmingly cisgender, straight, white, male. Part of this is the legacy of history. For example, the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest evangelical denomination in the U.S., got its start due to member churches' support for slavery prior to the Civil War. The Assemblies of God, a major Pentecostal denomination, began as an outgrowth of an interracial revival movement in the early 1900s, led by a black preacher, William J. Seymour. However, following that revival, a group of white preachers and lay leaders decided that they no longer wanted to worship interracially and then broke off from the black-led Church of God in Christ. Racism is baked into the DNA of evangelicalism, but historical roots aren't the only reason for the glass ceiling of leadership. Some evangelical congregations and denominations have explicitly barred women and LGBTQ people from leadership roles. Others may not have it listed in their bylines, but it's implied. Unfortunately, especially for people who are LGBTQ+, some seeker-friendly evangelical churches say they welcome everyone, and because of that, people who are LGBTQ+, start attending regularly and get emotionally and financially invested, only to find out, once the hooks are in deep, that, well, we love you, but we hate your sin, so you're unfit for leadership. By the way, this is a huge reason why the church clarity movement is so important. If you truly think you're right about your anti-gay and anti-trans beliefs, you shouldn't be afraid to be transparent about that. Even churches that have sought to break down these barriers struggle with integrating their leadership with those who break the cisgender, straight, white male mold. Is it any wonder that exvangelicals are disproportionately women, LGBTQ+, or people of color? Yet, as much as evangelical leaders like R.J. Sproul, Timothy Keller, and others lament the ever-increasing number of people leaving evangelicalism, you pause to seriously consider that it's the culture and the theology inherent in evangelicalism that could be the problem. It's almost always the leavers. They didn't really believe. They leaned more into their own understanding. They don't study or understand the word enough. They were focused more on people than on Jesus. A few, like Russell Moore, give a little bit of lip service to the support for Donald Trump within the fold that has led to a credibility loss for evangelical Christianity. But to seriously reconsider who they have as leaders, what they teach, and what they believe, 
that's a bridge too far. But the fact of the matter is that harmful and toxic teachings embedded in evangelicalism cause people to feel needlessly ashamed, to devalue themselves, to disregard the worth of other human beings. And the fruit it bears? Destruction and death. I am your host, Jay Poole, and this is Pot Stirrer Podcast. Welcome to Pot Stirrer Podcast, where politics, religion, and history collide, and it's not always polite. As our public spaces have begun to open up, probably a little too quickly, as the rollout of vaccines for COVID-19 continues, this has unfortunately come with a spate of mass shootings and deadly public attacks around North America. Atlanta, Boulder, Colorado, Vancouver, British Columbia, Philadelphia, Rock Hill, South Carolina, Indianapolis, Austin, and so on. And with these violent tragedies, so much is worth discussing. Gun control in the Second Amendment, mental health care, anti-Asian discrimination, inequalities perpetrated by police. Of all the recent events, I will be talking about the Atlanta shootings, and I'm doing so for a couple of reasons. First of all, the tragedy in Atlanta occurred about a month ago on March 16, 2021. At the time it occurred, I was itching to discuss it, but wanted to give a little distance between then and now, because more information typically becomes available as the days and weeks pass. And I'm glad I did. The other reason is that this deadly spree shooting case speaks to a number of issues in the United States in sort of a unique way. Of course, like many high profile shooting incidents, this case helped to reignite the debate between gun control advocates and Second Amendment supporters as to how best to respond to these incidents. And the high number of deadly shooting incidents in America more generally, so that such loss of life doesn't happen again. But in the Atlanta case, there's even more here to unpack. The killings took place in three Asian-themed massage parlors. While there isn't any concrete indication I can find that these parlors dealt in sex work, nor that the victims were sex workers. Massage parlors in the United States tend to invoke thoughts and images of sex work and human trafficking. Some of that is because it does indeed occur, and some of it is due to the fetidization of Asian women in mainstream American culture. In many of these mass shooting incidents, for example, earlier incidents such as Charleston, South Carolina, Parkland, Florida, Santa Fe, New Mexico, such tragedies are precipitated by the radicalization of young boys and men into alt-right and white supremacist ideologies. And while some cases, such as Parkland, manifest in attacks that are not explicitly racialized, the ones that make the news most often tend to have Black or Latino people as victims. A lot of times, anti-Asian racism sort of rides under the radar in public discourse, And it can manifest in ways such as racialized fetidization, which is not always easy to identify in the same way as most anti-Black or anti-Latino racism, but it is still quite harmful. The COVID-19 pandemic and the racially tinged rhetoric spewed by the previous occupier of the White House, as well as his supporters in the political sphere in response, has led to a rise in hate crimes targeting Asian people. In the Atlanta shootings, six of the eight victims were women of Asian descent. Yet other aspects of this case, such as the response of the police, both on the scene and when speaking to the press, hits on similar notes when compared to racist incidents involving Black and Latino people as targets. And let's not forget the added dimension of religion. I've discussed the problematic nature of evangelical Christianity multiple times during the four years this podcast has been running. And recently, due to widespread support from evangelicals for the presidency of Donald Trump and the involvement of evangelicals in the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, evangelical Christianity is finally starting to get examined under the microscope by mainstream media outlets. And that treatment 
is long overdue. The perpetrator of the Atlanta shootings was involved in a Southern Baptist church. And as I'll discuss later in this episode, his stated motive for the murders must be understood within the context of his belief system. You'll find that it's less about sex addiction, as most in our society commonly see it, and more about the repression and misogyny within purity culture. I'll be honest, for me, this tragedy hits different. I don't know the victims or the shooter, but I have family and friends who are of Asian descent. As a Black American, it's exhausting being discriminated against and being a target, and I would not wish that on anyone, not on my worst enemy, and definitely not for my friends and family. Also, while in college, I was involved in a campus ministry in a varsity in a chapter that was mostly Asian. There was good and not so good with that experience, but I made some great friendships while there. Some of the issues I will discuss in this episode call back to that time in my life. Let's start with the incident itself, based on information that has been released as of this recording. The morning of Tuesday, March 16th, 2021, 21-year-old Robert Aaron Long visited a firearms retailer and shooting range in Holly Springs, a town in Cherokee County, Georgia, about an hour northwest of Atlanta. While at the store, he purchased a 9mm pistol, passing a background check to obtain it. Hours later, in the mid-afternoon, the would-be shooter stopped by Young's Asian Massage, a massage parlor in nearby Ackworth, waited in a parking lot, then went into the parlor. He was there for a little over an hour. It's unknown what all he did while there, but what is known is that this is where he committed his first shootings. He shot five people. Two died at the scene, while two others died later. The victims murdered here were 49-year-old Xiao Ji Tan, 44-year-old Dao Yo Feng, 33-year-old Delania Ashley Young Gonzalez, and 54-year-old Paul Andre Michels. The fifth victim survived. The police showed up at the scene and detained the Latino husband of Delania Gonzalez, assuming he was the shooter. Meanwhile, the real shooter was headed to the city of Atlanta. An hour later, calls came into the police of a shooting at Gold Massage Spa, another massage parlor. Three women were murdered there. 51-year-old Hun Jung Kim Grant, 69-year-old Sun Cha Kim, and 74-year-old Sun Chun Park. According to the Chosun Ilbo, a Korean language news outlet, a witness to the shooting at this location said they heard the shooter say, quote, I'm going to kill all Asians, end quote. But survivors told NBC News that the shooter was completely silent as he killed three of their co-workers. The shooter then went to another massage parlor nearby, Aromatherapy Spa. When 63-year-old Yang A. Yu opened the door, the killer shot her right there in cold blood, killing her, and drove away from the scene. After the police in Cherokee County realized that the Latino man they detained wasn't the shooter, they released surveillance footage of the real shooter. The parents of the shooter recognized him and called the police. The police were then able to track him down 125 miles south of Atlanta as the shooter was reportedly headed to Florida and brought him back to Cherokee County. Police took him in alive. A day after the shooter was apprehended, a joint press conference was held with law enforcement who had jurisdiction over these cases including Atlanta police and the Cherokee County Sheriff's Office. While Atlanta police was tight-lipped as to the potential motive at that point, top officers from Cherokee County had a lot more to say, commenting that they didn't believe the attacks were racially motivated. Sheriff's Captain Jay Baker said that the shooter had, quote, an issue with porn, end quote, and was, quote, attempting to take out that temptation, end quote. He went on to say of the killer, Quote, he was fed up at the end of his rope. He had a bad day, and this is what he did. End quote. Sheriff Frank Reynolds speculated that the shooter, quote, may have frequented some of these places in the past, end quote, and, quote, might have been lashing out, end quote. 
Survivors who have spoken to the press have said they have never seen the shooter prior to the attacks. When asked if these massage parlors were tied to sex work, Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms said that the parlors were, quote, legally operating businesses that have not been on our radar, end quote, and went on to say, quote, we are not about to get into victim blaming, victim shaming here, end quote. So let's take a step back. The Atlanta shooting occurred during an uptick in high profile mass shootings, which has reignited the furor over gun violence in the United States and the ongoing debate between gun control advocates and supporters of the Second Amendment. The sheer amount of gun violence in this country, even when we take into account population size, is horrifying. And yes, we do need to properly address it. The best way to address issues, though, are at their root. The challenge is that the roots of American gun violence are complex, yet many on both sides seek simple solutions. If you're fairly new, so you're aware, I'm pro-Second Amendment. Some may see that as an odd position to take, given that I'm progressive in my politics, and I take leftist positions on most economic and social issues. But then again, there's the saying, if you go far enough left, you get your guns back. Most Second Amendment supporters in the United States are either libertarian or conservative. And on that side, the thing is that the status quo isn't working. On one hand, on the whole, with a few anomalies here and there, crime has decreased over the past 25 to 30 years. On the other hand, while we're seeing a decrease in overall gun incidents, serial killing and the like, Mass shootings have increased. Many Second Amendment advocates, particularly on the right, will either say we should enforce existing gun laws or we should focus on mental health. We should definitely enforce existing gun laws and also get rid of any caveats or loopholes that are being exploited. But that's not going to prevent circumstances such as the Atlanta shooting and a number of others situations that a background check won't prevent. Mental health issues are often brought up as well, especially in instances where perpetrators without prior criminal records commit mass murder. The argument is generally that these are lone wolves who had problems, so there was no way to prevent the incident in question from happening. But there are a couple of issues with this. The vast majority of people with mental health struggles are not violent and the association made between violent shooters and mental health can be stigmatizing for the vast majority of those who struggle with mental health issues. The last thing we want is to make people feel ashamed, feared, targeted, or judged when they need help. And here's the other part of this. We need to make mental health care universally accessible. And I'm not talking about temporary psychiatric holds or 5150s. I'm talking about publicly funded access to professional counselors, therapists, and psychiatrists to where people don't feel like they have to put off talking to someone or sharing their symptoms with a psychiatrist so they can be properly treated. The thing is, most deaths from firearms are not from mass murders or spree killings, but from suicides. And when people are considering ending their lives, it's important for them to have access to professionals without worrying about burdening themselves or their families with the cost, or without having to worry about taking too much time off from work or school. Many on the right who blame mental health for mass shootings also oppose universal health care, seeing health care as a privilege for hardworking people and not a right. Yet, if they were truly concerned about mental health and it wasn't simply some deflection, they would see health care, including mental health care, as a public health issue rather than a privileged reserve for those who can afford it. And we're not even going to entertain this idea that we wouldn't have mass shootings if everyone were armed, whether it's teachers or resource officers or your regular Joe walking down the street. We have a hard enough time with trained police officers not knowing their taser from their standard issue Glock. If Mrs. Smith thinks Juan and Jaquan in her second period math class are behavioral problems, should she really be packing heat? And I say this as someone who has the utmost respect for teachers. 
They truly have a difficult job. But I'm also aware of the racial and ethnic disparities in school discipline. And the last thing we need is to add firearms to that equation. Now, let's discuss the other side of the gun debate, those in favor of gun control. It seems like a simple solution. Get rid of the guns, get rid of the shootings. In a vacuum, sure. But nothing ever happens in a vacuum. Gun control in the United States has never been rolled out equitably. When it's rolled out, the targets are more often than not people of color. And the focus of gun control is often urban areas that are majority people of color. And this is how it's been for a very long time. For example, let's talk briefly about the reason why California has some of the toughest gun laws in this country. The 1960s were a very turbulent time in the United States with the Civil Rights Movement, the Chicano Movement, or El Movimiento, the Second Wave Women's Rights Movement, the Counterculture, and of course, Vietnam. Of all the civil rights groups that existed in the 1960s, the Black Panther Party was one that struck fear into the hearts of the white mainstream. The Black Panthers were a militant civil rights group that had chapters in cities across the country. They encouraged Black pride, Black power, and support of Black people by Black people. The group organized a school breakfast program for children in the community, set up health clinics to treat and educate community members, ran legal clinics, and more. The group also focused on protecting Black communities from police brutality and other racist abuses. Instead of taking the nonviolent stance of groups like the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, they believed that the Black community had the right and duty to defend itself. So Black Panthers would conduct armed patrols of their neighborhoods using the Second Amendment and state law that at the time allowed open carry of firearms. The Black Panthers were targeted by FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, as well as law enforcement and government officials on state and local levels. One of the ways the Panthers were targeted was through gun control legislation. In 1967, California Republicans, with the support of Democrats, pushed a gun control bill called the Mulford Act that would disallow open carry of firearms. This bill was aimed at disarming the Black Panther armed patrols and was supported by the National Rifle Association, or the NRA. A group of Black Panthers conducted an armed protest on the steps of California's state capitol building and while protesting announced Quote, the time has come for black people to arm themselves, end quote. After this protest, an addendum was added to the Mulford Act prohibiting loaded firearms in the state capitol, and the act was passed by the state legislature and signed into law by then-Governor Ronald Reagan. Yes, that Ronald Reagan. This started California down the road of having some of the strictest gun laws in the country. So let's say we're somehow able to execute gun control laws that in practice actually apply to everyone, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, geography, or region. Would that work out? No, not really. A lot of law-abiding Americans own firearms to protect themselves, whether it's in their homes or businesses or out in public. If people can't protect themselves, someone else will have to fill that void. And in our society, that job would fall to the police. The same police who can't tell a taser from a handgun. The same police who can't seem to keep from killing young boys and men, young women and girls of a certain color and hue because their existence makes them fear for their lives. The same police who donate to domestic terrorists like Kyle Rittenhouse and race soldiers who have killed black people in droves. The idea that we should submit to strict gun control measures and therefore trust the police to protect us. The police who have shown they cannot be trusted to protect and serve all Americans equally. It's a bit of a privileged take. Let's not forget that while white supremacist groups have been infiltrating police departments across the United States for decades, I'm not opposed to measures that make background checks more consistent and accurate. 
or the consistent execution of existing gun control laws, but Australian style gun control that will place our protection in the hands of race soldiers with badges will not bring about the safe utopia you think it will. When we look at the Atlanta spa shootings, we run into some familiar tropes. I mentioned when discussing the incident that at the shooting location in Cherokee County, police initially detained a Latino man whose wife had been shot and killed. On one hand, murder is more likely to occur at the hands of someone you know, especially a spouse or significant other, than a stranger. But on the other hand, from the information released thus far, it seems that that wasn't the reason the husband was held, and others had attempted to tell the police that he wasn't the shooter. Yet it didn't dawn on them that he was the wrong guy until more people were shot and killed. The shooter, a young white male, was taken into custody by police alive. And not only that, the police, at least the ones from Cherokee County, appeared to take the shooter at his word, discussing his declared motive at the press conference almost as if they were crafting his defense for him. It's one thing to feign sympathy with the suspect when attempting to elicit information or confession from him. It's another thing entirely to communicate with the public and by extension, potential jurors, that what the shooter did doesn't constitute a hate crime, he's struggling with a sex addiction, imply that the victims were sex workers he may have patronized prior to the shooting, and that he's just a young guy having a bad day. And it doesn't help that the police captain who made these statements was found to have posted racist t-shirts to social media that targeted Asian people. You know, it's the kind of thing that demonstrates that police are often unreliable narrators. The victims in this shooting seem to be pretty far down the list for both the police and the mainstream U.S. media. A number of articles on the shooting discuss the shooter and his life, which we will get into later, but not the victims. Even the Wikipedia page for the incident doesn't name the victims, at least as of this recording. It took me a bit of searching for me to find their names and even more searching to find information on them, but I felt it was important to do so. These were human beings, not just a body count, not just a listing of race, gender, and age. Dao Yo Feng was originally from a small town called Liangdong in rural China, where her parents worked on a farm to provide for her, her two brothers, and her sister. But when her father died, she dropped out of school to work on the farm. She left home at 14 to make money to send to her family, and in 1999, left for the United States. Here in the States, Dao Yo worked in cosmetic salons and massage parlors. She had planned to move back to China to open her own salon, but the pandemic kept her from leaving. She moved to Atlanta to find better employment and had been working at Young's Asian Massage in Cherokee County for only two or three months. Xiao Zhe Tan, who friends called Emily, was the owner of Young's Asian Massage and also owned another massage business. She was originally from Nanning, China, which is along China's border with Vietnam, where she had a daughter. She met her then husband, an American, while he was in China on business. They married, and in 2006, she and her daughter, who her husband adopted, were brought over to the U.S. Emily obtained her massage therapy license and got into massage therapy, opening her own businesses. The day of the incident, she was at Young's Asian Massage and was one day shy of turning 50. Delania Gonzalez was the victim whose husband was detained by police. She was the mother of a 14-year-old son and an eight-month-old baby girl. She was from the area and had worked at the local Waffle House for eight years. Delania and her husband had been married for less than a year and had visited Young's Asian Massage together for a couple's massage as a treat to enjoy themselves away from their kids. Paul Michels was originally from Detroit and the seventh of nine children. He had served in the United States Army in the late 1980s. He moved to Atlanta in 1995 to get into security system installation and in 1997 got married. 
He later opened his own security system business, but recently he had been out of work due to the pandemic. Paul then took a job helping out a construction site at Young's Asia Massage. He was just finishing up hanging up a shelf when the incident occurred. Hun Jung Kim Grant was born in South Korea and had worked in an elementary school, but later moved to the United States and had lived here for several years. She was a devoted single mother to two college age boys. Hun Jung had been employed in massage spas for a number of years and had tried to shield her sons from knowing where she worked due to the reputation these spas have for sex work and not wanting her children to worry about her well-being. She worked long 12-hour days at Gold Spa in Atlanta to support her family. Sun Chung Park was a lively, healthy grandmother who had emigrated from South Korea in the early 1980s. She had been widowed in her country of birth and was supporting five children as a single mother. She had lived in New York for most of her life in the U.S. and had worked a number of jobs to obtain U.S. citizenship and to bring each of her children here, which she was able to do successfully over a period of years. She moved to Georgia about 10 years ago and in 2018 got married. She was employed at Gold Spa as a housekeeper and cook, feeding other employees at the spa traditional Korean meals as they worked long hours. Sun Cha Kim was also a grandmother. She had two children and three grandchildren and had been married to her husband for 50 years. She had come over to the United States from Seoul, South Korea, knowing little English and worked two or three jobs to support her family. She had moved to Atlanta about 15 years ago and was living at Gold Spa while working and cooking and doing laundry for employees. Young Yu was a hardworking grandmother as well she was originally from Seoul and moved to the United States in the early 1980s after marrying a U.S. soldier. She was the mother of two sons and had three grandchildren. She was a licensed massage therapist and had worked in the industry for years, but had been laid off in 2020 due to the pandemic. She had recently been hired at Aromatherapy Spa and, according to her family, was excited about working again. These were real people with lives, with families who loved them, people who worked hard to provide themselves and those they cared for with a good life. What has bothered me a lot about the police narrative regarding this case is that this is being discussed as a human trafficking or sex work related case and that they claimed it is not a hate crime simply because the shooter said so. The implication, at least from my perspective, is that the police are categorizing the victims, especially those who worked at the spas, as the less dead. The less dead is a term used to describe sex workers and members of other marginalized communities who are murdered and are sort of talked around but not talked about as real people. The less dead are simply seen as labels, prostitutes, homeless illegal aliens. They never existed. They're just another body. There's little pressure from the public to solve their murders or prosecute their killers. And therefore, the police don't really care all that much either. The women involved in this case, who were employees at the massage parlors, had lived in the United States a long time. I haven't seen anything confirming they were sex workers. But even if they were, they didn't deserve to go out like this. Their lives mattered. The issue of human trafficking is an important one, as is whether or not sex work should be made legal. But those issues take away from the fact that these eight people are dead and they were killed by a perpetrator that saw them as objects rather than people. The objectification of the women working at these massage parlors shows that this is indeed a hate crime. Now, a lot of people, including the police and much of the public, have a hard time understanding how the Atlanta shootings could possibly constitute a hate crime. A lot of times, when we think of hate crimes, we think of tragic incidents, such as the mass shooting of black church members in Charleston, South Carolina, by a white supremacist who had clearly stated hatred for black Americans or the mass shooting in El Paso, Texas, 
where the killer explicitly targeted Latino Americans at a local Walmart because he believed in the Great Replacement, an idea pushed in alt-right and white nationalist circles that white people are being replaced by other races of people. Asian Americans constitute 5.4% of the U.S. population and around 3.3% of the state of Georgia. The fact that six out of the eight people killed were Asian women seems on purpose. Ever since the COVID-19 pandemic gained traction in the United States in early 2020, Donald Trump, who was then president, had made it a point to highlight the apparent origin of the virus in China, saying China virus, Kung flu, the Chinese virus. So stating these things in such a way that tapped into anti-Asian racism. This gave rise to conspiracy theories that blamed China for deliberately unleashing COVID-19 upon the world and led to an increase in discrimination, harassment, and hate crimes against Asian people here in the U.S. In this current climate, it's horrifying, but not surprising, that Asian people would be targeted to be killed by white supremacists and other people who hold prejudices toward them. And it makes sense that when this happened, that's where a lot of people's minds went, including centrists and liberals. The thing is, there is very little evidence, none that I'm aware of apart from the eyewitness statement made to Korean media, that the Atlanta spree shooter was going into the shooting with that kind of energy. But even if you take what he told the police at face value, it doesn't mean his actions weren't hateful or racist. This may be a time to sort of take a step back and very briefly discuss racism against Asian Americans. Asian people occupy an interesting space in the U.S. racial hierarchy. They are often framed as the model minority, a group that immigrated to the United States, became successful, and are held up by mainstream white society as proof that if you work hard enough, you can achieve educational and financial success comparable to white people. But the model minority myth is just that, a myth. Different Asian groups immigrated to the United States at different times, some with more financial and social resources than others, some with more formal education than others, some came to the U.S. to pursue additional educational or financial achievements, while other groups came over primarily as refugees from countries such as Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. And some Asian American families have lived here in the United States for generations. Not all are recent immigrants. It varies as to how financially or educationally successful or how socially accepted Asian people are in the U.S., just like any other group. The model minority myth also doesn't serve Asian Americans well. It can add additional pressure to perform or to pursue certain careers based on stereotypes and is limiting in its own way. The thing is, the model minority myth was never meant to serve Asian people at all. It's just meant to have a group for white elites to point to when discounting the experiences of other people of color, especially Black Americans. And the model minority myth, as well as other social and structural realities that deserve their own episode, lead to and perpetuate Black and Asian conflict. Preventing these groups from consistently uniting on civil rights issues, as these groups have been pitted against each other as the enemy. At the end of the day, it only perpetuates white supremacy. But the model minority myth isn't the only stereotype that plagues Asian Americans. For Asian women in particular, they often deal with an insidious mix of racism and sexism in the form of fetishization. This has a long history in the United States. Law and journalism scholar Michael Park wrote an article published in The Modern American in 2012 called Asian American Masculinity Eclipsed which was a really helpful source for this episode in terms of historical background. In the mid-1800s, Chinese men immigrated to the United States en masse to perform unskilled cheap labor for the California gold rush and to construct the Transcontinental Railroad. On one hand, 
White elites welcomed the influx of labor, viewing them as more hardworking and less expensive than white laborers. But at the same time, these laborers weren't fully accepted by society. The government didn't want to encourage Asian families to settle down in the United States, which was why Asian men were brought over by themselves rather than with their families. The idea was that they were supposed to do the work and then go home. At the same time, the government didn't want Asian men to intermarry with white women either. This was the mid to late 1800s, and racist views in regards to white racial purity and intermarriage were still very commonplace. So a few Chinese women were brought over, but throughout the 19th century never exceeded 7.2% of the total Chinese population in the U.S. The assumption held by immigration officials were that any Asian women who were not married to merchants or diplomats must be sex workers. Later in the 1800s, as the government was seeking to stem the tide of Chinese immigration, and later East Asian immigration more generally, Asian women would be targeted through the Page Law of 1875. The Page Law was a federal statute banning the immigration of Asian laborers from, quote, China, Japan, or any Oriental country, end quote. Their words, not mine. The law also banned the immigration of Asian women, quote, for the purpose of prostitution, end quote. In practice, the law didn't really do anything to stop the flow of laborers arriving from countries like China and Japan, but it made it more difficult for Asian women to immigrate, leading to a 68% decline in Asian women entering the U.S. from 1876 through 1882. And Asian people were also excluded from citizenship until the 1940s. These early sentiments and the response by the federal government laid the foundation for the view of Asian women as sex objects, as it was assumed at the highest levels that all but a few were women of low moral character. Historian Ellen Wu, author of a book entitled The Color of Success, discusses how this early treatment of Asian women carried over throughout the 20th century. She says, quote, These associations that Americans already have of Asian women being engaged in this lewd and immoral type of behavior gets amplified as the United States begins a series of imperial excursions, essentially, or wars in the Asia-Pacific region, end quote. In the mid-20th century, the United States became involved in military conflicts overseas, particularly in East Asia. Japan during World War II, then during the Cold War, the U.S. was involved in the Korean War, as well as the Vietnam War in Southeast Asia. The U.S. also executed military operations in Laos and Cambodia during the same conflict. During these military operations, U.S. soldiers came across women who lived in these countries. Some entered into consensual relationships with American servicemen, while others were involved in sex work. Still others were victims of the war and treated as disposable, collateral damage. The view of Asian women as available for sexual gratification was highlighted in American entertainment, such as the 1987 film Full Metal Jacket, which included a depiction of Vietnamese sex workers during the Vietnam War that has been used to denigrate Asian women to this day. The fetishization of Asian women, this view of Asian women as exotic, hypersexual yet submissive, the lotus blossom, or the dragon lady, tends to be a theme when looking at the historical record as well as in contemporary depictions of Asian women. The objectification and stereotyping of Asian women is a common trope in pornography, which regularly uses racialized tropes of women of color, and also contributes to the consumption of hentai in the West, hentai being pornography in animated form that originated in Japan. Anime and manga fan communities in the West have also been plagued by weeaboos, anime fans, mostly white men, who are obsessed with Japanese culture and Japanese women and are looking for a waifu. It's one thing to find people attractive based on certain attributes, but it's another when potential partners are objectified based on their race or cultural background. And Asian American women 
face many of these stereotypes, whether they're dating or working or socializing or just living their lives. It isn't just an annoyance. It can also lead to them being targeted for sexual assault and other forms of violence. When the Atlanta shooter told the police that he had previously visited two of the salons he targeted during the March 16th spree shooting, and when he said that he saw the women as a temptation that he sought to eliminate, that speaks to the shooter's racialized misogyny. His words tick the boxes of culturally ingrained stereotypes of Asian women, and he targeted these women as fetishized sex objects, as alluring temptations that he viewed as expendable. The police have taken the killer's account at face value, but don't see this omission as a racial motivator? It just shows how ingrained in the dominant culture racialized misogyny is. So ingrained, it's just accepted as a given. Catherine Siniza Choi, an ethics studies professor at University of California, Berkeley, said in an interview with NBC News, quote, killing Asian American women to eliminate a man's temptation speaks to the history of the objectification of Asian and Asian American women as variations of the Asian temptress, the dragon ladies, and the lotus blossoms, whose value is only in relation to men's fantasies and desires, end quote. This racialized misogyny Asian women face tends to be discounted and not really thought of in the same way as other types of racism. It's important to remember, though, that not all racism is white hoods, N-words, and other racial slurs, and even the softer forms of racism can be very damaging, dehumanizing, and deadly. There's one other aspect to the Atlanta shootings that I think is important to talk about. That would be religion. Along with his parents, the 21-year-old shooter was a longtime member of the Crabapple First Baptist Church in nearby Milton, Georgia. From all accounts, he was deeply involved in the church and had been for years. This church is affiliated with the Southern Baptist Convention. The church wiped its website and social media after the shooter was arrested and his church involvement was made public and later brought their website online with a statement regarding the shooter and their statement of faith. Their statement on the incident notes that the church had since removed the shooter from their membership roles and said in part, quote, We want to be clear that this extreme and wicked act is nothing less than rebellion against our holy God and his word. Aaron's actions are antithetical to everything that we believe and teach as a church. In the strongest possible terms, we condemn the actions of Aaron Long as well as his stated reasons for carrying out this wicked plan. The shootings were a total repudiation of our faith and practice, and such actions are completely unacceptable and contrary to the gospel. No blame can be placed upon the victims. He alone is responsible for his evil actions and desires. The women that he solicited for sexual acts are not responsible for his perverse sexual desires, nor do they bear any blame in these murders. These actions are a result of a sinful heart and depraved mind for which Aaron is completely responsible, end quote. But is the shooter completely responsible? Yes and no. At the end of the day, the killer had a choice and he chose poorly. But the ideology that led him to the March 16th spree shooting didn't just magically appear in his mind. It's an outgrowth, or fruit, if you will, of what his faith taught him. Crabapple First Baptist Church was quick to wash their hands of longtime member Robert Aaron Long, but the church and evangelicalism as a whole shouldn't be so quick to wash their hands of any responsibility for the loss of life that occurred on March 16, 2021. The killer's church is part of the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the largest evangelical denomination in the United States. And it's a denomination that has seen a lot of controversy recently. SBC leaders condemned the teaching of critical race theory, which in short is an academic theory that makes the case that race is at the root of America's historical and contemporary realities. I discussed critical race theory in more detail in episode 82, 1984. The SBC's decision to condemn even the idea 
that race has made a difference in how our country developed and what it is now. It's a bit odd, given that the SBC as a denomination exists because of its early leaders' support of African chattel slavery. If I feel charitable, I would say they lack self-awareness. But if not, which today is that day, I would say they're self-aware wolves. Regardless of how aware they are, that have every opportunity over each generation, they take the retrograde stand when it comes to race. This time, it has led to several black pastors leaving the denomination. The denomination's view on women in ministry, they don't like it, and their relentless verbal assault on popular evangelical author Beth Moore has led her to leave the SBC recently as well. But not only that, the church the shooter was a part of is affiliated with Founders Ministries, a reformed movement within the SBC. Reformed churches tend to be very conservative and are Calvinistic. In other words, they believe in predestination, that God already knows who he will save and who is destined for an eternity in hell. According to reformed Christians, there's nothing we can do to make that choice one way or another. And while the chosen or the elect can make a confession of faith and are encouraged to do so, that is evidence of salvation through God's sovereign grace rather than a choice to partake in salvation for all given through Jesus Christ. But for the purposes of this episode, the thing to understand is that Founders Ministries is a group that is pushing the SBC in a more religiously and politically conservative direction. They have led the push against critical race theory and recoil at criticism against the church founders who are all slave owners. They also see the work of anti-racism as, quote, an anti-Christ ideology that uses racism as a means to fight supposed racism, end quote. It's a tell. It shouldn't then be a surprise that the leadership at the Shooter's Church by its own admission, acknowledge that they've never done a sermon on racism. I'm not sure how any American could have lived through four years of Donald Trump, and especially 2020, and not think that racism is something worth discussing from the pulpit. But given that the church is part of a denomination and affiliated with a parachurch group that, at best, dismisses the impact of racism in our society, Of course, to them, racism wouldn't be anything worth talking about. After all, it's not real, they say. It's only real to those people who imagine that it exists and blame white people for their own problems. And then, after such a tragic killing perpetrated by one of their own church members, their associate pastor, Luke Folsom, fixes his mouth to say to his congregation, quote, we don't have answers. We don't know why this happened. End quote. Well, the shooter claimed to have a sex addiction, and he confessed that he committed the murders because he wanted to, quote, eliminate temptation, end quote. But let's talk about what that actually means. You see, while the church has avoided discussing racism, they have not avoided discussing sexuality. The shooter's church is in line with evangelicalism generally in the belief that sexuality of any kind is only allowable and permissible within the bounds of marriage between one man and one woman. Purity culture is a movement within evangelicalism that tells single adolescents and adults to abstain from any kind of sexual contact prior to marriage. Within purity culture, men and boys are considered visual beings who are weak to their sexual desires. And it's the responsibility of women and girls to keep them from stumbling, so to speak. This means that women and girls within churches and ministries that promote purity culture are expected to dress modestly in a way that doesn't arouse male sexual desire, nor allow themselves to be placed in positions where males are tempted to act on these desires. As for the expectations of male Christians in purity culture, they're often expected to avoid females generally. So they may be told not to be alone with a woman, particularly non-family members. They're told to avoid images that sexually excite them. Of course, pornography, as it's explicitly sexual, 
but it can also include magazines, TV shows, and other visual media with attractive women. In purity culture, men are also told to bounce their eyes or avert their gaze when they see a woman or girl that arouses them sexually. For example, the Christian radio and TV ministry, New Life Ministries, which is an advocate of purity culture related beliefs, outlines a way for Christian men to battle sexual desires they view as sinful. To conquer said sexual desires, they say, quote, the first way to start is by making a list of your greatest enemies. These could be lingerie ads, either in a seemingly harmless department store catalog or that Victoria's Secret magazine that your wife left laying around. It could include billboards. It could be TV shows or ads. It may be female joggers. Or maybe it's that female coworker who tends to dress a little suggestively. And then there's always the beach, end quote. As you can see, purity culture is problematic for a lot of reasons. Here are a few of those reasons. It holds women responsible for the desires of men, characterizing men as weak and women needing to dress and act in ways to mitigate that supposed weakness. It implies that men can't control themselves, which suggests a low view of men. This is one of the big reasons why sexual abuse in churches tends to be downplayed. Perpetrators are forgiven and placed in positions to reoffend, while victims, especially female victims, are often blamed for inviting the abuse through immodesty or allowing themselves to be alone with their abusers. It also classifies women as objects of potential sexual desire and temptation. A woman jogging is just jogging, minding her own business. But to a man that she may or may not know from Adam, who is deeply invested in purity culture, she has been reduced to the enemy, this thing that by its very existence is leading him to think thoughts that his faith tells him are sinful and are keeping him away from God. In our common parlance, most of us tend to think of sex addiction as someone who has a lot of sex but can't quench their thirst. And by the way, sex addiction isn't an actual psychological disorder according to the DSM-5. But in evangelical Christianity, sex addiction is much more broad. According to psychology scholar Joshua Grubbs, quote, there's a large and growing body of research that shows that conservative religious values are strongly linked to feelings of sex addiction. We find that men in particular are likely to interpret normal sexual urges as pathological and then act on them in ways that they find to be problematic, end quote. When the shooter says he has a sex addiction, it doesn't necessarily tell us a lot about his actual behavior. In evangelical Christianity, looking at the cover of Vogue at the grocery store and getting turned on can fall under sex addiction. Watching porn, which many people are able to do without engaging in pathological or abusive behaviors, can also fall under sex addiction. When discussing his research with noted evangelical author and advocate Chrissy Stroop, Grubbs said, quote, a lot of people report that they have problems with their pornography use. For example, they feel out of control or are addicted. For some people, these feelings are a sign of true compulsivity or dysregulation. That is, for some people who report being addicted to pornography, their use is out of control and addictive in nature. However, there are also quite a number of people who report feeling out of control even with minimal use. For these people who may only be using pornography less than once a week, the best predictor of whether or not they report feeling addicted to pornography is whether they morally disapprove of pornography use. That is, moral incongruence about pornography use, using pornography even when you think it is morally wrong, seems to be a very important part of why some people think they have an addiction. And what leads people to morally disapprove of pornography use? Religiousness, particularly conservative Christian religiousness, seems to be the driving factor, end quote. The shooter may or may not have had actual compulsions towards sex beyond what would be considered healthy in a context absent purity culture. 
but his faith community taught him as a 21-year-old who is likely going to have natural sexual urges that those urges were sick and deviant. He was weak to them and he required help or else these would keep him separated from God. Prior to the shooting, the killer had been kicked out of his parents' house, reportedly for getting caught watching porn. He had undergone treatment at two evangelical facilities with the aim of getting his sex addiction under control. But apparently, in his mind, this didn't work. He had apparently visited Asian-themed massage spas before. It's not clear if he received sexual services there or not. But as a 21-year-old who could have gone to nightclubs and visited strip clubs or patronized sex workers on the street or escorts of all types, he chose these Asian-themed massage parlors. He had a type likely influenced by the fetidization of Asian women pervasive in American culture. And despite being kicked out of his parents' home and having gone through two separate treatment programs for his addiction, he still had these urges. The temptation was still there. And for 21-year-old Robert Aaron Long, the temptation needed to be eliminated. But those who he objectified were real-life people whose lives were snuffed out way too soon. Thank you so much for listening to Pot Stirrer Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Prime, or on your favorite podcast app. Check out potstirrerpodcast.com slash download, and the links are right there. Subscribing gets you new episodes once they come out, so you don't have to wait. If you enjoy the podcast, please give it five stars and leave a review. And I'm always on Twitter. I'm always tweeting, so follow me there at PotstarCast. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future because freedom is not free.